coming up on Theater Talk. When you're working with a star, is the star the muscle or is George C. Wolfe, the star director, going to be the muscle? I, probably me, but uh... <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. You know that big cop scandal in the 72nd precinct, the Buddy Boys or the 77? I uncovered that. You uncovered that. I am that guy, and I'm not going to be a reporter forever. At some point, I'm going to have a column. The next Jimmy Breslin. Bigger than Breslin. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And Susan, we are delighted tonight to be joined by one of New York's finest directors. He has done some major, major work over the years. George Wolf uh, is now represented on Broadway with a fine production of Nora Ephron's Lucky Guy. But you have seen Caroline or Change, the wonderful top dog underdog. He did our friend Elaine Stritch's great show, At Liberty, Jelly's Last Jam, The Wild Party. Um, Angels God, in America. It, it goes, it, it's, it's longer than George Abbott. You're getting into George, <laughs> George Abbott. I'm feeling almost as old as George Abbott these days, too. <laughs> and, George, congratulations on your Tony nomination. Thank you very much. Thank Absolutely. Very much. For, for Lucky you. Guys. Yes, and and yeah. welcome to Theater Talk. Glad to be here. Glad to so, be here. So, uh, we want to talk about uh, your life in the theater, but let's just touch on Lucky Guy first because you were in the unusual position of taking Nora's play after she died. Mm -hmm. And having to kind of, um, you know, get it ready for Broadway. Mm -hmm. You're a writer as well. Did you have to do any rewriting of the play in any way? Was it pretty well? No, I think so. But the thing which was so brilliantly fascinating, and there were many fascinating things about Nora, is that she was so ridiculously organized. So she had this archive of interviews that she had done with all the people who were in the play. Right. She had about four or five drafts. So what I what ended up happening more often than not is Nora kept on rewriting Nora. And you could just stitch Nora in. Stitch, stitch Nora. Nora in. And we said this is based on the life of Mac, Mike McAlary. Yes. Yeah, newspaper before. column. Exactly. But did, did she know him? She did not know him. The thing with, I mean, there, there's so many sort of interesting, fascinating things. She read his obituary and said this would make an amazing play. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how she got involved. Yeah. And 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 it's 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 the, 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 there are just these parallels that, that are just astonishing because McAlary was on chemo while he did the Abner Louima case. Right. And then and then Nora was on chemo while well, she, she was, was writing the, the you know Lucky Guy. And there's just these and the play just re reverberates with this incredible sense of emotion and 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 reaching beyond yourself regardless of limitations and discovering who you are inside the story it's you know it was a thrilling it's i think it's a thrilling play and i i spent 9 months with her she would come to my house once a week and you know and we go through the script and then she'd go off and do another draft and turn it up and it was just it was just this very intense joyful charged because collaboration is charged experience and i just kept on going breathe you know normally yeah. you don't have to rush another draft but, but did, did you know she was uh, how sad she was? At n nothing, no, absolutely nothing. Really interesting. And 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 I think just as, just just I mean, she testament. had the ultimate deadline in a way. It, it, it saying, but also just the, the incredible elegance and focus yeah. Yeah. that she's you know. And I later found out that she would do you know we'd have a note session. She'd go home and work as hard as she could, and then she'd rest. And it was it's at, you know at, at 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 first when I found out about it, I felt I was in a state of shock as many people who were, who had who had worked with her and were close to her. And then as time goes on, I'm sort of in awe of the, of the sort of the bravery and the purity of the focus and, and, and the grace that she afforded everybody else. As being a newspaper, an old newspaper man myself, I love it because the, the, the play captures the last heyday of newspapers. Um, and what it also does, though, and, I, and I'm curious to know if this is why you were attracted to it, it does capture kind of a New York that is no longer here, the uh, New York of the 80s and the 90s. Totally that love that New York. In. Yeah, and I, then I, 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 I moved to New York in 1979. Like you said, I loved, I loved that New, New York. York. Of our youth. Exactly. What brought you? Now you were born in Kentucky. Yes. Right? What brought you to New York in 1979? I, I, I went to school in California, P Pomona College, and then afterwards I went to LA to do theater, mm -hmm. and I was doing that. And then at one point I started getting, you know, some good reviews in the LA Times. And at one point I had a meeting to to work on some sitcom, and I remember going in, and one of the, and the head writer said, "Oh, he's quick. We're going to have to tie one hand behind his <gasps> back," <laughs> and I went. 
I'm moving to New York. I can't, you know what I mean? Because I was too young. I was 23, 24. I went, no, no, no. Let me go. Let, let me go do the war. Let, let me go do the war and put myself in the city. I first come to New York when I was 13. Right. Because my mother came here to do some advanced degree work at NYU. And so I, I was here and I went, uh-oh, this is it. When you say that uh, you went to L.A. to work, were you always going to be a director or were you writing and acting and doing? Well, when I first went to college, I was, I was an acting and design major. Oh, but then I hated drafting, so I stopped designing. <laughs> and then I switched to acting and directing. Directing. And in the last year there, I wrote a play that ended up doing well in that American College Theater Festival stuff. Mm. So, but I, I'm too much of a control freak to ever really be an actor. So <laughs> I knew that once I got out, I, my focus became writing and directing. But then when I came to New York, they said, you can't do both. So I, then I focused on the writing, and that's when Colored Museum happened. And after I established myself as a writer, then I was able to establish myself. How long did it take you to do Colored Museum? And it was Joe Papp, was it not? Who? Yeah, uh, it started out at Crossroads Theater in New Jersey, and then it came to the public theater. Now, you eventually came to run the public theater, but what was your... What was your first impression of Joe Papp? I mean, how did he how did he treat you as a as a young kid with a play he wanted to do? Joe was Joe was I just like I, I remember I remember at one point that there was there was this interim period where where it was Michael Greif, David Greenspan, Joanna Kalaitis, and I we, we each given the theater oh, that's there. That's right. That's right. And and I bumped into and I bumped into John Guerrero one time, and he said, "So which daughter are you, Goneril or blah blah blah?" You know. <laughs> and I had this I don't know where whether it was I think it was the right time. I had this incredible, generous sort of very protective relationship with Joe. I think he was very fond of me and I adored him. I remember one time when I was working, I think it was a Caucasian chalk circle, and I was coming down the, uh, the steps of the Martins and I was walking with him and we were talking about something and he stopped me and he put his hands on my shoulder and my lips are very, very pink and he went, are you wearing lipstick? <laughs> and I went, no, Joe. And he put his hands, he said, if you were, it wouldn't matter. And I went, okay, thank you. Joe. But it was just, it was such, a, you know what I mean? It, there was so much sweetness in it, and he was very, and so I did, I did the play, I did Color Museum there, and then a few years later, after I'd also done Out Across the Road, Spunk, and then he offered me a residency, and at one point, he said, he said, if you want to create your own theater, you can do it here, and, and, and we'll be the umbrella organization. And by that time, I had started to work on Jelly, on Broadway, so I wasn't quite a able to do that. But there was there was a very it, I, he was always very nurturing and very generous to me, and a very f amazing, powerful, powerful personality. Did you all always have a desire to be in the the Broadway in the commercial theater? Was that part of your ambition coming to New York? Um, I think probably yes, because like I said, when I, I remember very specifically. When, when, when I came to New York when I was 13, I remember very specifically, I saw Hello, Dolly! with Perel Bailey, oh, and I you. saw this production of, of West Side Story uh, that was at the State Theater. Mm -hmm. And I remember very specifically, just at, at one point doing the quintet just before the rumble, just leaning forward. And, and, it, I was, and I realized, in retrospect, I realized I was studying it. Oh, I, I wasn't just mesmerized by it. I was studying something. And in many respects, I went, oh, that's theater at its peak. Right. You give the audience just enough, and their imagination and their heart and their feeling supplies the rest. And I, it was, it was, I mean, it was, I was 12, but I remember, I went, oh. And so, to my mind, it was a place where you could play and do something silly and wonderful like Hello Dolly, or you could do something that had edge and bite mm. uh, like West Side Story. And, I, and also, we, I, I was staying around NYU at the time, uh, and, and there was a mobile production, mobile theater production from the New York Shakespeare Festival that Joe Papp had directed of Cleavon Little in Hamlet. Yep. And I remember watching it, and I remember at one, very, at one point, I mean, I'm from Frankfurt, we don't have winos. There was this wino going, yeah, I know it, yelling at the <laughs> stage, and I think, Sort of, I've always been drawn by this phenomenon of bringing, in many respects, the rawness yeah. of what I saw mm -hmm. in, in Washington Square Park in that production with the refinement. The polish of a Exactly. Broadway and what happens commercial. when you bring raw and elegant together, right. I think, can create something thrilling. It's called the Lane Stritch at Liberty. Lane Stritch at Liberty, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think, in many respects, that's my aesthetic. So I always wanted to bring things to Broadway that I thought complimented and challenged the aesthetic. Bring on and the it, noise. You bring in the noise, bring yes. in the funk, exactly. Yes. And yes. Jelly's Last Jam, too, which is real, with the wonderful Gregory Hines playing not a sympathetic 
Broadway leading man type, but Jelly Roll Moton, a very complicated, yeah. almost unlikable guy. Well, because I think that's, I mean, because I remember I was in the NYU musical theater program, and there we go, is a character likable? Is a character likable? I said, the first damn musical I'm going to write, nobody's going to like it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to hell with you and your likable crap. But I, cause I, I really firmly believe that if, you, if a character is human and flawed and goes through some sort of catharsis, we find ourselves inside of them. Yes. And that's also, it also helps when you have somebody as dazzlingly charismatic as uh, as as Gregory was, or Tom Hanks, or Tom Hanks, you know exactly, and so that therefore you know their personality and their charisma and their charm become the breadcrumbs mm -hmm. that an audience will follow as they go on the journey, and then they'll come out on the other side, hopefully with the aforementioned grace. Mm -hmm. At and, what point in the uh, creation of Lucky Guy with Nora Ephron did you think about Tom Hanks? Well, Tom, I guess Tom and Nora had talked about it, and she had showed him an earlier draft. <clears throat> and then uh, sometime around um, January of whatever year, I think that was 2011, we did like a 10-week workshop. We got together a bunch of actors and Tom, and, uh, and we did this 10-week workshop. And after that, Nora and I went back to work, and then a couple of times Tom would come in and we would go through. So he was always a part of the equation, and as time went on, he became a much more active participant in the equation. Now, you've worked with uh, Tom Hanks and, and, and Gregory Hines and um, uh, Elaine Stritch. Who has, you, you know, the old, uh, the wonderful old book, The Season, with uh, William Yeah, Golden's, great book. Yeah, somebody said, you know, on any, any big show like that, there has to be the muscle. When you're working with a star, is the star the muscle, or is George C. Wolfe, the star director, going to be the muscle? I probably me, but uh, <laughs> but no, I don't. <laughs> but I don't. Love I, don't I don't. I don't necessarily view it that way. I think that that your one of your jobs as, as a director is to make sure everybody, not not just the actors, but the designers, that they're everybody's working on the same show, and. And, and, to, and also, but I'll say, you're, and, and I think that's a very important part of your job. I think the other important part of your job is to create an incredibly safe place where everybody can feel in command mm -hmm. and everybody can, can say, no, what about this? What about this? What about this? I mean, I think my rehearsal rooms are sort of have an energy of anarchy because I'm, I don't, because if people are, feel, feel playful, then they will, then they will screw up. Mm -hmm. And in the process of screwing up, they will discover something brilliant. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you create an atmosphere of repression, that same dynamic won't happen. Right. So, so I, so I think I, I use the muscle to make sure we're all focused on the same project. But I think there are two schools. I think there are two broad fundamental schools. I mean, there's the Jerome Robbins school that you know I am the king. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you, know, you do what I tell you to do. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I. You know, the, the mind, the mind, his mind, dazzling, dazzling, dazzling. Right. He came to the first preview of Angels, which I will never forgive him for, but the mind, <laughs> dazzling, 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 but he was very complimentary and generous. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think there are two schools of directing. I think you either stand where you are and demand other people come to where you are, or you go to where they are. Mm -hmm. And you charm, seduce, engage, arouse them to go on the journey, and then they end up where you think you should be. If you do the latter, they bring along their secrets. Right. If you do the former, I think it represses, I mean, there's, I, I remember reading something of a French director, I forget who it was, said that if you break an, if you break an actor's spirit once, it never comes back. <laughs> so, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I probably err in this, I think I'm very indulgent because I love actors, mm -hmm. and, I, and I like to create a, a safe place for them to play, because, not just because, it's a nice thing to do, but they're just going to do amazing, challenging, challenging. And then your job is to say that's what that's I want. it exactly, and to help and shape and shape. As opposed, to if you stand, I'm, I'm you know I'm you know I'm an intense guy, but I'm not a fascist. <laughs> All right, George C. Wolf, one of our great, great directors. Um, uh, he is nominated for a Tony for Lucky Guy, starring Tom Hanks, Nora Ephron's last play. Thanks a lot for being our guest tonight. Glad uh, to be here. It was fun. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm just speaking the, the truth. The truth is you don't give a shit about anybody or anything but yourself. You're climbing a greasy pole, you f Ready for your close-up. Soon, you'll be wearing makeup on the picket line. You said you wouldn't tell anybody I was going to Florida. Yeah, I did. I promised. You promised. But you know what? Changed my mind. If I got turned out over my concealed weapons veto, then I say so be it. 
and sayonara. More guns in people's pockets meant more people dead. There was no compromise to be had. Now, I did tell them, I told them that I might could consider a law that let guys carry guns uh, hanging from a chain around their neck. <laughs> Because that way, that way we could say, look out, he's got a gun. Now, you know, Susan, Ann Richards, the uh, governor of Texas, was one of the most colorful characters in politics in the last 25 years. She has been brought vibrantly and brilliantly back to life on Broadway in a new play called Ann, written by and starring a great actress and a very colorful woman in her own right, Holland Taylor. That's pretty good. Welcome to the well, How's that I for an like introduction? That. You like that For one? somebody who looked like he just walked off the beach digging clams, that was a really good one. <laughs> With no cue cards, That's by the a way. really oh, good one. Or the Bowery drinking well, you know, but you've touched yeah. a, you, you've really caught me here because I'm a total political junkie. I mean, I, I'm more interested in politics than I am in theater and have been for years. And I remember as a kid watching that um, uh, Democratic convention when mm -hmm. Ann Richards came out. And I did not know who she was, but this woman Me came too. out who had incredible charisma. And then she said of George Bush, poor George, he was yeah. born with a silver foot in his mouth. Yes. One of the greatest lines ever entered mm -hmm. at a political convention. Yes, yes. But you know, interestingly about that line is that it's held up as a great insult to the Bushes. I'm sure the Bushes didn't think so. Because if you think about it for one minute, it isn't sarcasm at all. It's what a guy would say to a guy at a roast. <laughs> it, would get a, right. it would get a slam on the back pretty good because sarcasm is when you say something that is not true in an oily kind of way. Uh, uh, so what you say at a roast is something that is true <laughs> that everybody gets a laugh out of. He, he was admittedly, self-admittedly, sort of clumsy in the way he said things, and he was born to privilege. Yeah, I think um, uh, George Bush Jr., George H.W. Bush, yes. he was furious about that line. Uh, I, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Because he eventually ran against her and defeated yes. her for governor. No, Texas. Karl Rove defeated her. Ah, yes. All right, tell That us. was where Karl Rove cut his ah, teeth, cut and he teeth, is yeah. one of the most brilliant minds in politics that has ever lived or will ever live. Right. Although his techniques are less successful now because I think the internet makes secrecy less less possible. Also, I think he diminished himself when he was on Fox calling the election for Mitt Romney when, when his own network had predicted that. I, You know, I saw that later on. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been able to keep up with things, but I did see that later on, you know, in the internet. I thought, wow. Right. Now, let me ask you, what attracted you to Ann Richards in the first place? Well, it wasn't her politics, and you, you've seen the play, mm -hmm. which I'm delighted to hear. You know, therefore, that it isn't political. It's about, no, it's a, about a human being. It's about a human being. Yeah. But, I mean, it is... Uh, it is about politics in the way a play about Amelia Earhart would be about aviation. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just the milieu she was in. Right. She's a great human being. But um, it is a mystery. I, I knew about her election. It was very thrilling. And, but I didn't even know she hadn't won her second term. Mm. I didn't follow her career. And she came to New York. Did she you was, meet her later on? I met her very late, about a year or two before she died. She was friendly with Liz Smith. Very, yes. Best friends. Yes. She was, she, I think for... And Liz Smith was a slightly older uh, friend in New York who was from Texas, right. also oh. from a little town. And I think they, you know, had a real camaraderie. Mm -hmm. But you and, didn't hang out with them. Oh, no, no, no. I had lunch with her once. Yes. That even had nothing to do with this, right. except you meet her. Uh, you ain't been met to you, you meet her. I mean, <laughs> now, how so? How so? Because she looks at, the, well, like you hear people say of people, you are the only person in the room. Ah. If she's looking at you, you may be the only person in the world <laughs> if she's looking at you. And the, the most intense blue eyes, not light blue, mm. piercing blue, and a face that you're, you're looking at and you're thinking, gosh, you really are very wrinkled, but you're the prettiest woman in the world. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's interesting you say that because that has been said by all of the great politicians, that when they focus on you, they make you feel that you are the most, imper most important person there. Bill Clinton, it was said of. Lyndon Johnson, it was said of. Well, I think in both cases that you mentioned, that's the source of that is a natural warmth. Yeah. A certain kind of heart. Yeah. Clinton's heart, need I say more? Yeah. And, and Anne has a heart, too. Anne Richards is just uh, the core, is a hot core. Now, let me ask you, um, what was it that you think, talk about this in the play, but uh, what drove Anne into politics? Well, I don't know that she was driven at the beginning. She would say that underlying her whole adult life was the civil rights struggle. Mm -hmm. And she, as a young woman, 20-ish, was in poor, at election time, was in poor communities, uh, 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 rural communities with a 
cardboard table set up with others trying to encourage people to pay the poll tax, which was unconstitutional yeah. and cost $1.25 to vote. Yeah, yeah. And she was doing that at 21. So civil rights was the most important thing for her and continued on, which is why she filled all of her government posts with uh, a representative representation of the people of her state, uh, along with the good old boys. Mm -hmm. You have Hispanics, blacks, gay, disabled, and crackers. Asian, <laughs> rep and Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I would say civil rights drove her to do everything. Right. And he was in her 40s before she ran for public office on the encouragement of others. Yes. And yes. Al already a mother of a, a, a four. four. So she was four. And she had a yeah. Yes, she a was grandchild. so driven in many in many Well, her first drive was to do what her mother brought her up to be, which was yeah. perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> perfect wife, mother, yeah. lover, nursemaid, cook, yep. chauffeur. Right. Except there are those demons though because she was an alcoholic. She was a big drinker, but she was not she, as she herself said, I passed out before I got into any real trouble because I, I couldn't stay awake. Right. She was a fun party girl. Right. She gave parties. She and her husband were hosts of, of, uh, of all of Austin or all of Dallas, wherever they were, the Democratic guys, the Pauls, all to their house. Big beer kegs out on this big lawn. <laughs> Janis Joplin would be there. I mean, just, it, just they just were fun in that way. Yeah. But uh, it got to the point where uh, her children were worried and concerned about her driving and Anne was sort of oblivious to it. She was just extremely busy in the community. Drinking was just part of her life. It's part of the life of that era. Of that, that era. And uh, her, her close friends, uh, Jane Hickey, who was her closest friend and political aide, because <clears throat> she was county commissioner by this point, had the guts to arrange for a, an intervention, yeah. which, which everyone cooperated with. And uh, Jane said, I will risk the friendship. Yeah, yeah. But it worked. It did work. Yeah. And Anne never looked back. Yep. She was in a treatment hospital for 10 years, spoke of it always, was a big AA proponent thereafter. Now, you, uh, a lot of people who knew her well have come to see you in Washington and here, including, yes. including the Clintons, who were yes. very, very close yes. to... Hillary twice. Hillary twice, right. And, and you, you said to me that when Bill came in, he was practically in tears. He, no, he was in tears. His face was wet. Because you recreated and Meryl, her so Meryl was seated with him. Meryl Streep, yeah. And Meryl, ever a friend to the actress, uh, sorry if I hit my mic, um, took me aside. It was the most wonderful conversation with Meryl. I have to confess, she kind of drunk the Clintons because I was like, <laughs> Meryl. And, uh, and she said, she said, he kept jabbing me and saying, this is so accurate. This is exactly like what she was. And she said, Holly oh, was crying. Yeah. I was crying. I said, really? <laughs> yeah. It and is, then, I think. You know, he was. It is one of the hardest things to do, though, as an actor, which is to not do an imitation. Actually, this, I'm so glad you brought this up because I didn't come from that angle. Yeah. I mean, I was in the ballpark. Yeah. First of all, I talk a hundred times faster than she ever talked because <laughs> her style was cold honey. Yeah. And her comic style, telling jokes, was deadpan. Mm. Well, that's fine if you're going to intersperse a few jokes in a serious speech, but you can't deadpan through. Well, I mean, some people have that skill, not me. <laughs> so I'm very much more vocally you know, energetic than she is. Have you worked out all of the Ann Richards physical things you're going to do or each Oh, no, no, I do, I do it whenever I want. You might move the cup here, you might just... Oh, no, I do it whenever I want. You do whatever you want to, yeah. but in the character, of course. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, in the, in the office scenes, it's extremely literal, mm -hmm. very exact, tiny details. Very, I just behave. Yeah. In the speech part, it's a, a, a much more elevated and theatrical and, and a sort of... Um, at moments, almost balletic, mm -hmm. to tell this story, mm -hmm. like you talk to a very intelligent child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the office scene, it's completely uh, realistic behavior. Yeah, fascinating. It's a clear demarcation. Um, we have to wrap it up, but uh, you've been with this play, working on this play, seven years. So that's actually six, because I it was about four months after she died that I. Thought. It just was. I was attacked on the road with the idea that right. it had to be a live play. And you've been you've extended till September. September first. Which, which, which incidentally, by coincidence, 
would be her 80th birthday. Oh, oh, wow. We just love that. The play is called Anne, Don't Miss It, about the, one of the most colorful political figures of our time, Anne Richards, performed brilliantly by Holland Taylor. It is at the Vivian Beaumont at Lincoln Center, and one of my favorite parts is when you get the phone up and you say, get me that guy from Disney, I want to see the Lion King again. And then what do you say? I've seen it. I say, I've seen that show seven times by now. I can play Simba's mom <laughs> <right> now. <laughs> That's it. Holland Taylor, thanks for being our guest on Theater Thank Doctor. You. The father of our country was born in Texas. And oh, when he was just a slip of a boy, he took his little hatchet he walked out into the backyard and chopped down the family mesquite tree. <laughs> and when his father walked out into the yard and saw the only shade for 50 miles lying dead on the ground, he called him out. He says, George, did you, did you cut down this mesquite tree? And George says, well, yes, I cannot tell a lie. I took my little hatchet and I cut the tree down. And his father said, well, son, we are going to have to move to Virginia. <laughs> And George says, oh, Father, do we have to move because I shamed the family by cutting down the little tree? And his father says, no, son. It's because if you can't tell a lie, you ain't going to amount to anything in Texas. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.